Hey everybody, welcome to Coding Nomads webinar on Python, machine learning, and data science. My name is Ryan Desmond, and I'm a co-founder of Coding Nomads. Coding Nomads is a software engineering training company. We have online and in-person courses in both Java software development and Python software development. And today we'll be talking with Yuri, who's a machine learning and data science engineer at Apple, about what is Python, what is machine learning, what is data science, what does this all mean? We're going to ask him all kinds of questions. And for those of you who are interested, we have a little Easter egg at the end, which is a promo code discount for any of our upcoming online or in-person courses, um, if you register within the next few weeks. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into it. Um, Yuri, if you wouldn't mind, just give me a little bit of your background, kind of how you got into software engineering, how you got into machine learning, um, and we'll take it from there. My motivation was to actually uh, make my own video games. So uh, my dad, actually, he was an engineer, so he showed me a little bit of how to code and kind of pieced it together, built my own game. It was like a tank warfare game uh, early on. So never since then, yeah, I've been um, very interested in programming. Um, kind of took it throughout high school, but didn't do too much, and then went for college in computer science and uh, started working during college. Uh, yeah, and pretty much I've been uh, working in computer science ever since. So machine learning is uh, not something I got into right away, of course. That's actually pretty recent, only the last three years uh, have I gotten into it. So, I mean, there's been like a big revolution in machine learning the last few years and uh, yeah, some really cool stuff happening that got me intrigued. And so I yeah, started to kind of study it on the side. Uh, and then eventually I uh, started uh, applying towards jobs in the field. Got it. Um, it's, yeah. When you first started working at Apple, did you start as a machine learning engineer or were you already working as a software engineer and kind of make your way into the, into the machine learning team? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So it's actually, it was a mixed role. Uh, that was a little bit of both. Um, and I think we'll talk about this a little bit later uh, on like, like what, what's a good strategy for getting into it if you're new. But I had pre-existing skills, basically in general programming, um, which really helped me uh, basically land the position. Uh, so it's kind of a mixed role where I'm supporting machine learning engineers and over time basically started working more and more on the machine learning things. Got it. Three years ago when you first got started, how did you get in? So you already knew Python, you were already a comfortable programmer. How did you make the transition from just a kind of a core Python software developer to machine learning engineer? Yeah, uh, actually didn't know Python at the time. Uh, oh, so Python nice. came with the machine learning. Um, but uh, yeah, so I started by uh, taking uh, Coursera courses, actually. There was a free uh, specialization um, that's like a series of six courses, very comprehensive. Um, took that, it took me a, a while to get through that. It was actually about a year of doing uh, this Coursera course on the side. And, you know, I, I was very interested in the topics, but there was a lack of like continuity on my part. And it was kind of, after the year was over, I had finished it, but I felt like I hadn't really mastered the material that well. So it definitely was a little, was a little tough at the beginning. And then I did a few projects at work, actually, that involved some of the things I had learned, which kind of got me back and motivated again. And then I took another uh, Coursera course that was a little bit kind of more advanced. And for some reason, by then things started clicking. So I think it was just like a matter of enough exposure to the concepts. Right. And I picked up a lot more uh, momentum then. I yeah, mostly on Coursera online resources. Nice. Yeah. I completely understand and empathize with what you're saying about basically just enough time. When I first got started as a software engineer, I was not um, just this immediate whiz where everything just made sense and it all just fell into place. And I was born to be a software engineer. It took me easily three to six months of really hard study after I graduated college to really feel like things were starting to click into place and where I felt like, okay, I'm legitimately good at this. I'm a software engineer now, you know, and it, it just takes that persistence, that recurrence, that repetitiveness that, um, to just keep getting okay. after it. Kind of like learning any other language, you know, if you're trying yeah. to learn Spanish or French. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, and the thing, the thing is, is it's also very um, machine learning and I guess computer science in general can be very intimidating because there's so, so many different topics you can study. Right. There's thousands of algorithms, thousands of, you know, patterns to doing certain things. Uh, so it can be very overwhelming. Um, and it's not until you start seeing the patterns between these things that it kind of started clicking for me because you start seeing it's the same technique being like it has, it's wearing different clothes, but it's the same person, right? 
Right. It's like, it's the same technique being used over and over again. At first they look like different things to you, but then you kind of start processing it and right. your world kind of becomes smaller as you become more comfortable with it. So. Right. Yeah. That's very well said. So in an attempt to kind of start to decode that for the people who are watching this, um, one of the things that I would love to kind of learn from you as we chat is kind of the, first of all, it seems kind of like a progression, right? And I'm curious actually what you were, what programming language you were working with before Python. So I'll, you can include that in your answer, but, um, it seems like a progression where you learn the pro, you learn Python, for instance, and then you can kind of start learning some, maybe some data engineering or some data, data analysis, and then you can kind of start playing with some data science and machine learning. And so um, I'd like to ask you kind of how, what, what does that, if you could explain to a friend of yours uh, that wants to become a machine learning engineer and start, starting basically from total scratch, what does that kind of path look like? If there's, you know, if you could minimize it down into a handful of steps, kind of what would you recommend that this friend of yours do? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I can definitely outline the steps that I took and I will say that there's more than one way to get there. Um, right. For example, I, I know I have colleagues who took the other way. They started more on the math statistics side without too much programming knowledge and kind of came in from it that way. Uh, and it's actually quite interesting because they, like you end up with two different, uh, two different skill sets when you go both of these routes. but. Yeah, my route. So um, I would definitely recommend uh, learning Python uh, first. So, I mean, any programming language is fine, but if you wanna, if you know you already wanna do data science and machine learning, uh, Python's the way to go. It's easy to learn and it has all the like software packages you would want for data science. So, we definitely recommend that. Um, after um, having a good understanding of Python, and by good, I mean, you don't need to go into you know crazy details i mean programming it's itself you can go very deep studying that uh, but i think just like any kind of i don't know month month and a half course on coursera would get you enough to get started with data science um, you don't need to go down the programming rabbit hole um after that i would definitely master some uh some basic like data science packages for python uh, so a popular one is NumPy or SciPy. Uh, these are just numerical packages that do numerical computation and data processing. Uh, pretty much any data science course you'll ever take will use NumPy uh, as long as you're using Python. Quick interjection there. If you could kind of just briefly describe what NumPy is used for. What's a, what's a kind of real-world application of some software that you write using NumPy? Sure. Uh, yeah, so it's basically, uh, it, it provides uh, basic math functions. So and it does it at a large scale. So for example, um, you can load a large, like a large CSV of data. Uh, if you have a, like, you know, billions of rows of data that you wanna process, uh, something that you don't wanna do using your own handwritten code, right. it, it would take a long time to optimize. So right. NumPy can basically do some processing on a large data sheet very quickly. Um, so you can quickly create an aggregate of some data, visualize it maybe, um, yeah. Nice. Uh, oh, so go ahead. You were—I interjected when you were talking about how once you know Python, then start to you know deal with some NumPy, SciPy um, kind of packages and modules. Yeah, and then I would say uh, probably another good skill is visualization. That's very key in any kind of data processing is um, learning how to graph uh, data, how to visualize it, and there's you know very common uh, Python libraries for that as well. So Matplotlib, for example, is a very popular one. Uh, and again, most data science courses will use it, so it'd, it'd be good to, uh, to have a little bit of knowledge on that. Um, and then the next step, once you have some basic understanding of these things, um, I, I would say take, take an online course, uh, and you don't even have to take a paid one. Uh, I would encourage you to look at some free resources online. Um, Coursera has some great uh, free data science courses available. Um, and just go through those and yeah, have, have fun with it. Right. Uh, so that would, that would be the next step. Uh, and after that, hopefully you're motivated enough. Um, like I said, for me, even though I was enjoying the material, it was a matter of not having enough momentum. Right. Um, so definitely being able to apply it on the job or maybe in a personal project on the side, I think is also key uh, during this step. So you're not just memorizing material from the course, but you're also uh, working on something and applying it towards something. Right. To give Coding Nomads and other co companies and organizations like us a little shout out here, this is oftentimes where kind of taking the next step and applying with a course where you have mentorship 
or somebody that you could talk to, somebody that's asking lots of questions, somebody that's kind of guiding you because there's, there's kind of a, there's a big gap oftentimes between um, what you can kind of learn and do by yourself, no matter how many tutorials and videos you watch. And some people are, are you know, I've worked with several developers who are just really, like I mentioned, and, and you know, if you were programming games at 14, um, you're one of them. But pe people who can kind of self-teach a little bit, right, where they can figure a lot of this stuff out. For a lot of people, and I would say I was, I was probably um, in this category, getting from those tutorials and that entry level kind of, I'm starting to figure it out to up to where you're actually productive using these tools, where you can build complex software using these tools. That can be a big gap to jump there. And that's oftentimes where, you know, when we talk to people and people who often come to our courses, that's kind of the gap that they're currently facing and they're not sure how to get across it. But in, so kind of the next step, so I'm just curious personally, um, how, how did you come about working at Apple as a machine learning engineer? Yeah, uh, so, uh, actually, the reason I got into machine learning in the first place uh, was because I was very excited about the developments that were coming out in computer vision. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the area of machine learning, I guess, that got me excited and that I wanted to pursue. Uh, in particular, um, I don't know, some, some of you guys may have seen it, but there was a really cool, uh, I think it was 2015 or 16, they basically were able to take uh, a painting of Van Gogh and uh, take any image and basically merge the two. So they were able to reproduce this, the image that somebody took off their camera right. as if Van Gogh had painted it. So they basically right. took the style and moved it over. So that was like amazing to me because, you know, it's like, wow, no, no previous technology could possibly do this. This looks like, you know, human work uh, done by a computer. So it was really cool. Right. So anyway, computer vision is what I was excited about. Um, and so, uh, yeah, when I was, when I was looking for jobs, that's kind of what I was looking for. And, uh, so I'm currently working on Apple's basically face detection uh, team okay. uh, for face ID, kind of working on um, face recognition. And then again, I'm, we'll get back to kind of the, you know, the more interesting stuff, but I'm curious about the interview. How was the, um, just at a, on a personal level, kind of, how was the, the interview to get that job? Was it tough and grueling or easier than expected? Yeah. Um, so it was interesting. It was, it was actually easier than expected for sure. Um, I don't know whether that was, you know, luck or, <laughs> um, but so my role, as I said, was mixed. Um, I, I was coming in for a mixed programming and machine learning uh, position. And it was actually interesting because I was inter interviewed mostly by machine learning people, but they knew they were interviewing me partially for like more of a compu traditional computer science background. So I don't think they quite knew how to interview me. <laughs> so we definitely talked about uh, lots of machine learning topics, which I was already familiar with, um, but it wasn't anything, you know, anybody who ha did, a, did some course or uh, has, has done one or two side projects and has kind of played around with it a little bit, I think could have answered. Nice. Uh, so yeah, easier than expected. Well, that's that's good to know, and that's prop that's that that I'm sure that brings a lot of hope to a lot of people out there that are uh, that would love to learn that job. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's um, let's digress a little bit and actually jump into this material. So, for the for the again for this you know this hypothetical friend of yours who's who's trying to, that says I want to um, you know people have all kinds of reasons I want job security I want. Uh, to enter a job, you know, a healthy job market. I want to be able to work remotely, whatever, whatever it might be that draws somebody in now to becoming a software engineer. And they ask, um, like, what is Python? And or and in in the context of all the other languages, what kind of distinct distinguishes Python against Java or C or some of the other kind of top languages? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, they're all. Uh, at least all the ones you all the ones you mentioned, um, they're extremely similar in the sense that they're general purpose programming languages. Um, if if you were just going in for kind of learning a language for to become a programmer, I would say you know any of those would be fine. The concepts are extremely transferable. Uh, like I when I started data science, I picked up Python in, in like probably less than a week. In two weeks, I was fairly proficient just because it mapped so well from the language I was already familiar with. So what was that? What was that? Uh, it was primarily C sharp that I was working okay. with before. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so even though like it looks different and the, the concepts are all the same, so it's very quick to transition. 
Um, but for, for data science, I mean, Python all the way, um, just because um, you will have a much easier time finding the right libraries, finding the right help online. Uh, there are some machine learning languages out there, uh, like Julia, for example, is an, exa uh, is an, as an example. Um, that's kind of gaining traction, but there's just so little documentation, so little packages that, especially as a beginner, it just it wouldn't make sense. I wouldn't recommend it. And one of the things I've always kind of heard is that Python got picked up in a big way for kind of the data, data science and machine learning crowd because, as you mentioned previously, a lot of people were coming into this from more of the mathematical quant side, right? And they were looking for an easy, comprehensive, all-purpose language that would allow them to turn their models, maybe sometimes in R or, or still just in the math equation level, into a program that could then execute that on large data sets. And so they looked for uh, basically the easiest, most useful, all-purpose language uh, that they could get, which is Python. And I might be oversimplifying that, but because of that decision, um, and this is what I heard, and I'd be curious if you agree, basically um, the community around data science and machine learning has become so big that there's been all these different libraries and packages and modules that have been written by all these third parties and open sourced. So it's created this kind of community of people and tools that you can use for these tasks, um, which kind of lends Python towards it. Not that you couldn't basically do the same thing in C Sharp or Java or any other, you know, full, full purpose kind of general purpose language, but you would have to write a lot, a lot more code from scratch, whereas in Python, there's other people that have already been working on it, and you can kind of work from, on, stand on their shoulders a little bit. Is that a per, kind yeah, of Yeah, yeah, that, that's excellent. Um, yeah, I, I would say the community and the, the amount of, like, examples online that you can find is, is totally the reason, yep. Nice, so understanding that Python is really um, just another general purpose language, I completely agree, it's kind of like, a loop is a loop is a loop, a variable is a variable is a variable, a function is a function a function, you know, across all these languages, sure, the syntax might be a little different, but the concepts are extremely transferable. Um, but so once you know Python, kind of, what is, again, for your friend, who, this hypothetical friend who's just trying to figure all this out, like, what is machine learning? And if you could, if you could distill machine learning down into this most simple concept, what, how would you explain it? Yeah, um, so uh, actually I have an analogy for this uh, that I like to use, um, but essentially the way I think of it is traditional programming um, is kind of like you're telling the computer the recipe for a particular dish. So you're telling the computer step by step uh, what is in the recipe to make this dish. Uh, machine learning turns it around a little bit. Instead of giving the computer the recipe, um, you show the computer you, you make a bunch of dishes that are pre-made and you show the computer what the dishes are and the computer's job is to come up with the recipe. Okay. Um, so it's kind of a little backwards. You're giving it the end result and you're asking it, okay, please, please figure out what the recipe should be to get to this end result. Nice. Um, nice. Yeah, so you're accomplishing the same thing, but just by yeah, two different ways. Maybe just for anybody who maybe had trouble with that analogy, kind of, can you explain it again kind of in another like, you know, bite-sized job? Yeah. I, I guess maybe through a like, more concrete example, let's say I wanted to um, detect like cats in the pictures, do like a cat detector. If I were to code it with a traditional approach, um, I don't know, I would, I would write some code that maybe tried to detect like a triangle for the ears and maybe loop over the image and see if I can detect in something that looks like an ear and maybe an eye and okay. you know try to basically handcraft what it is i'm looking for right um, with machine learning you can actually find these examples online these days you can plug it into a framework all you need is a thousand images of cats um and the computer will figure out what a cat looks like you don't have to like explain it to it like that a cat has ears and a cat has eyes and a cat should be somewhat furry it will infer it from the data so you just give it a bunch of data and ask it to, to figure it out. Nice. So it's the yeah. brave new world. Yes. And so these pictures, <laughs> just out of curiosity, do you have to do any kind of image processing on them beforehand? Like, do you need a cat on like a black background or can it be like a cat out in the forest? You know, like does, it, does the noise of the data kind of affect the, the algorithm or how it, how, it, how it comes out? Yes, uh, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, we can go into lots of detail about this, but for example, uh, like it, having only cats with black backgrounds would be a horrible idea, actually, because uh, mm -hmm. your algorithm might learn that if there's a black background, that means it's a cat. 
okay. instead of learning about the actual cat. Interesting. Uh, so you have to be very careful. Um, your, your, the algorithm will always try to do its best approximation, but you, you don't always know what it is that it's learning. It may not be learning what you want it to learn. Got so it. yes, like making sure the data is representative of what you want it to learn is very important. Nice. Interesting. Um, and then, so let's do that same exercise, if you don't mind, on data science. So what is data science? Yeah. Um, so data science, uh, I mean, obviously two very related concepts. Um, but whereas machine learning is more um, a computer learning from data, I see data science as more a human to computer uh, relationship. So it's the human analyzing uh, the data and uh, maybe figuring out what it is that um, your machine learning model is learning. So it involves visualizing the data, looking um, at uh, maybe the data distribution. Like for example, um, like if we go back to the cat example, you may not have any data with orange cats. And so when your software sees an orange cat, it may not, not think that it's a cat, mm -hmm. right? So you need, to, you need to find these edge cases in your data um, and you know, uh, kind of look at it from a more statistical perspective. So that's kind of more of the human aspect is you need to research the data, massage it, and make sure it fits what it is you're trying to do. And that's kind of the more data science aspect of it. And then so what's, um, if you could come up with a kind of, what's a day-to-day -day kind of practical example of, of a data, you know, kind of a data science in action. So I would think, um, and this could also be machine, like you said, they're two very interrelated things, but in my mind, because I'm not, I have not done much data science work, I would kind of think that maybe, you know, um, let's take uh, cryptocurrency for some reason. Like, let's say that we want to track and forecast, um, you know, stock prices or cryptocurrency prices, right? And we want to take the last 10 years of data, analyze it for trends and let's say trade volume and whatever, economic indicators, and then forecast out into the future. Would that be data science or would that be machine learning or is that kind of both? Yeah, um, no, I think definitely the initial research phase would be data science. It's like um, what, 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 what you might call uh, feature engineering. So it's like deciding, okay, what pieces of data do I want to feed into my model? What, what, like to predict the stock price, maybe I care about the weather. Maybe I care about, uh, you know, what uh, President Trump tweeted today. Uh, so kind of this human aspect of what do I need to feed into my model and looking at how it's going to affect the end result. That's, that's data science. Where does this all tie in to, you know, let's say, let's use the stock prices analogy if that works. Um, mm -hmm. When, when, like, cause you even mentioned, you know, a good place to start is, you know, learn Python, get comfortable. You know, some people come in from the math side. If you didn't, you know, if you came in from the programming, kind of the engineering side, probably getting comfortable with statistics and that kind of stuff is good for a data science machine learning engineer. Where does where do these kind of models um, come in? When you you for instance, I hear people say all the time training the model, right? Yeah. Where so if you could like help me understand what that all means. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so a model, uh, I mean, a model can be a very simple thing. Uh, for example, um, a model could be like let's say I'm observing that, let's take Newton, Newton's example, an apple falls from the tree, right? I, I, I see an observation, the apple fell from the tree. Now I wanna be able to, how do I rationalize this? How do I generalize this? I might decide that, um, I might be genius like Newton and come up with a concept like gravity, that's a model, but I might have another model. I might think like the, the air is pushing down, right. right? The pressure of the air is pushing the apple down towards the ground, that's a model. So a model is basically kind of, how do you explain what's happening in a simple way? You don't wanna explain every single apple, you wanna come up with a general principle that explains all apples. So that's kind of a model. Um, so kind of the cat example, a model will be this average, uh, this kind of idea of what does an average cat look like? It's something that can internalize thousands of cats and now it can recognize them because it knows, okay, a cat, is this furry, like small thing with pointy ears. That's right. a model of a cat, so. And then when, let's say that we, so when we're training the model, is that basically the concept of giving your algorithm a thousand pictures of cats? And then do you, when you train a model, do you go 
over the data more than one time? Do you analyze that data in more than one way? Um, is there kind of, or, or do I just say, dear algorithm, here's a thousand pictures of cats, and then when I give it a picture, it can tell me true or false that this picture contains a cat? Yeah, um, yeah. So the, the way the way you can think about the training process is, let's say you have pictures of cats and dogs, mm -hmm. and you ask the model to when you're training a model, you're asking it to differentiate between the two. Mm -hmm. Essentially, what it's going to do is it's going to find the average. It's going to average all the cat pictures and average all the dog pictures, mm -hmm. and then when you show it a new picture that it hasn't seen before, it's going to say, "Well, is it closer to my average cat or is it closer to my average dog?" Right. And that's going to be the answer that it gives you. Now, I'm oversimplifying it, but essentially, that's kind of what it's doing. So it's, yeah, averaging everything it's seeing and creating this idea of, okay, this kind of looks like more like a cat than the dogs I've seen. Right. Um, no, I, I, yeah, that makes sense. So, Sorry if I'm um, over asking big questions. With No, no, questions. this is great. Yeah. Um, and so look, switching gears a little bit, why... I mean, we even joke, like, Python is so hot right now. Data science is so hot right now. You know, yeah. um, we say it, like, lovingly and jokingly. Um, but it is. Python is so hot. Machine learning is so hot. Data science is so hot. Why? Like, why, in your opinion, why, why are these three things, Python, machine learning, data science, so hot right now? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think there's two reasons that are often cited for uh, why right now. Um, one of them being that we have an abundance of data these days. Um, just so many internet connected devices collecting data all over the world. So the data is plentiful. Um, two, we finally have enough processing power with the cloud, with GPUs, uh, to basically do meaningful uh, computation on that data. Um, in fact, the algorithms that are uh, currently used for neural networks and like the fanciest basically machine learning stuff they were all, the math is like, you know, statistics and calculus, like stuff you, most people took in college. Uh, the techniques were invented, most of them in the 70s. Uh, so like we've had this stuff for a long time, but I think it's really the, the technology and the amount of data has evolved to a point where we can actually make use of it. Right. Now why it's hot, it's, it's amazing, like the things that basically uh, machine learning models have been able to do. Um, that other previous algorithms and previous approaches just aren't measuring up. Uh, for example, one aspect is, uh, one uh, example is face detection. Uh, a computer right now, the latest neural network, can detect faces better than a human being, which is very interesting to think about because like face recognition is like a, like a primal like thing that we have a, as humans have in our brains. Like we, we recognize our mothers from like day one, right. right? And computers are now beating us as of a few years ago. Um, no, like no previous computer algorithm came close before <laughs> neural networks became a thing. Uh, another incredible, like for example, um, there's plenty of companies right now doing um, MRI dete uh, problem detection. So when your doctor takes your MRI, like computers can now diagnose problems better than doctors, better than radiologists. Uh -huh. So it's like replacing this industry where like radiologists get paid a lot of money and they study for years, right? Learning how to do this. And computers can now do this better and more effectively. So it's like solving these huge problems that previous approaches couldn't. Right. So yeah, do, I think it's changing. Do you think that, you know, I think a lot of the reasons that people get into software development or want to learn, for instance, Python, machine learning, that data science is, it's definitely a field that is going to do nothing but grow. Is that, would that be a correct assumption? That's correct. And not only um, like data science, I think it's not only the data science field, I think it's going to affect all the other fields. Um, every, it's hard to think of an industry that wouldn't be affected, I think, by uh, these technologies in the coming decades. Right. It's almost like, um, it, I, I don't know what version it is, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, but I talk to people all the time about learning software. And one of the, especially for people that are coming from separate, different backgrounds, like they might have had a previous career in geology or hydrology or uh, finance or whatever it might be, but it's the software at its core cuts across basically every industry because what industry wouldn't be better with, you know, some automated software or at least more, more effective and allow people to be more productive and allow factories to be more productive and precise, um, basically in anything that you're doing, whether it be 
geophysics or or literature or anything, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe the next phase of that same kind of concept is applying these now more intelligent uh, concepts, data science, machine learning on top of it to make the, rather than just a really fast machine that can do a bunch of instructions really fast, now it can learn and make, make its own decisions, which I'm not gonna lie, is a little creepy at times <laughs> when thinking about it. You know, I kind of like the computers yeah. to be doing, you know, sitting over there kind of doing what they're told, but um, yeah. as long as there's always an off switch, then I guess we're in good shape. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so in the Python and machine learning data science world, could you kind of maybe, what kind of major frameworks are at play that, that are maybe the most common frameworks? And I mean, you mentioned NumPy and SciPy, but are there any common frameworks or kind of, once you know Python and you're kind of moving into the next tier of kind of professional development, what are some common yeah. frameworks um, and or tools that people are using on a day-to-day -day basis out there in the real world? Yeah, uh, well, TensorFlow is a very popular package uh, for, uh, that's a neural network package. Right. Um, so once you kind of get it, get out of the kind of the basics of data science and you're more interested in doing some neural network training, uh, TensorFlow is a great place to start. Um, it's focused primarily on um, uh, graphics, but it, it it handles like many tasks now. So it, it has some, it can do like natural language processing and um, audio stuff. So yeah, it's a great package for learning neural networks, and they have amazing tutorials where like literally. You, you don't need much experience, like a little bit of Python and you can follow along. Nice. They provide you with the data set, you download it, you train it, you see it working. So nice. it's, it's become very, very accessible. Nice. Um, yeah, I would say that's probably the main one. Uh, there's alternatives, of course, to TensorFlow, like MXNet uh, is an alternative, uh, but I would say TensorFlow is the most popular. And then are you, like on a day-to-day -day basis, when you're writing code, are you, using are you just writing pure python that's using some modules and um libraries and packages or are you are most of your applications like also part of some other like you know the analogy and with java is that um very very oftentimes we're building anything web related um you'll be using the spring framework right or if, or if you're doing anything for instance like amazon's got all these great services um where you can basically plug your code in you're basically leveraging two or three large components that are all kind of um, coming together to make the application work. In your day-to-day -day programming life, are you are, are there any other frameworks outside of TensorFlow that you're using? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, and yeah, not a simple answer. So that's fine. Yeah. Uh, for the for like the training and the, the data science aspect um, and kind of creating the models and getting something working, I would say it's all Python. It's all TensorFlow, it's all NumPy, and kind of these basic tools that we've talked about. Um, now, if you actually want to release a product, very often, that is not Python. Um, especially if you're releasing a product, like, for example, on a phone. Um, usually, somebody will take the work that you've done in Python and rewrite it in a different language for, and at that point, there's frameworks. Uh, right. For example, iOS has uh, CoreML, which is their machine learning kind of runtime that's not written in Python, uh, but you would use that uh, framework to actually deploy your model. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Similarly, you can deploy a model onto AWS, um, it, um, so you can create a web service straight out of your model. Right. Uh, so you would use their frameworks for that. Nice. Cool. But yeah, for the actual, if, if data science and like the machine learning uh, model creation is what you're interested in, then TensorFlow, NumPy, and Python. Got it. Nice. Good to know. Everybody always likes to talk about how great this is, how it's the future, and you got to learn this and that. For somebody who's just getting into this, maybe what would you warn them against? How about that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So some of the rough edges. Um, one rough edge uh, I think I've already mentioned is there is so much information out there. And uh, very often it's incredibly mathematical and can be intimidating for people that uh, you know, are not very mathematically inclined. Um, I would encourage you to persevere through that or maybe find some uh, material that kind of skips over some of the nitty gritty details. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I say don't be intimidated by that is not because you won't have to learn that. I think at some point further in your career, it's very important to know some of the, you know, the theories behind these things. Um, but I think it can be a hindrance uh, when you're trying to, to do something and, and get, get feedback from what you're learning. 
I think it's it's better to kind of skip over some of the nitty gritty and just get something working, getting a feel for for it, etc. Um, uh, yeah, pr probably another dark corner is the like the, the math side. At some point, like at, at least if you want to go down the technical route, uh, you won't be able to avoid. So to to get like uh, if you want, if if your goal is to be a data scientist or like a machine learning engineer at a at a big company, you will have to know uh, basically statistics, um, have a good understanding of statistics, um, and know like the math behind these neural networks. And it can, you like just do, going through like the tutorials online and setting up a cat and dog detector, but not really understanding how the underlying algorithm works will not be enough at some point. Right. Um, okay. So I, I guess I would say, don't think you can like take a one year or two year course and be done like this. You're going to be learning for a long time if you uh, go down the data science right. uh, route and it's always changing. So there's always going to be more to learn. That's the beauty. I always tell uh, people I'm working with to, to enjoy the struggle, right. To start to try to enjoy the process because there's never an end to what you need to learn. When you, you know, there's other, like I previously, when I was younger and going to college, I worked as a bartender, right? And in the beginning, you have to learn all these drinks. You have to learn kind of how to do everything that you need to do. And, uh, but at some point you kind of know all the drinks and kind of the opening procedure and the closing procedure. You're kind of, right. you kind of know everything about that job, right? With software engineering, that is, could not be farther from the case because it's just always <laughs> changing. It's absolutely massive in the number of routes you can take, which is oftentimes really overwhelming. Um, especially, right. I know when you're first getting started, you know, I talk to people basically on a daily basis who are just trying to understand where to even start and kind of the, find the path through it. Um, so I can speak to the same thing that you just said that um, this entire career, I've been in it for 12 or 13 years in software development. And I f somehow, after a couple of years, I found a way to enjoy the struggle. To enjoy because when you're when you have to learn something new and it's really difficult and you don't want but like your brain doesn't want it right sometimes our brains yes. are like, i don't want new information this is difficult like can't we just do it the old way but after a little while after you do that enough times and succeed at it right you don't always succeed but after you do learn something new and push through that struggle and all of a sudden you're like i know how to do this now and you do that a few times then all of a sudden you yes. realize that there is a reward on the backside of all of this hard work right so yes um, yeah. and often it's um I think I'll talk about this later too, the power of like visualization, but it's like seeing the same concept visualized or explained in different ways multiple times and eventually like it clicks. Like okay. th that's why it's, it's very hard to like some of these machine learning blogs you will read and they just like, you'll read them once, you'll read them twice. They don't make sense. Like you read a third blog still doesn't make sense. And sometimes like it's taken me a, sometimes a year of reading this concept over and over again here and there until finally like, Oh, I get it. <laughs> right. Nice. And then you're like, yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. exactly. um, so real quick, let's, um, I'll read Michael's question here. So it says, hi, Yuri, in your career in machine learning, um, data quality is quite, in your, yeah, data quality is quite important. How much time do you spend generally on projects in looking at data before you start using machine learning? Like, so I guess maybe that might be kind of data sanity, data quality, data, um, like munging, I've heard it called many times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, to be honest, I would say like most of the time. Um, so the actual machine learning process itself is fairly automated these days. Um, so, I mean, you basically, you're responsible for a few pieces of code here and there, but really like a, a framework like TensorFlow uh, will do the heavy lifting for you. Um, your job uh, like to, is to set up the problem in such a way that the framework can effectively learn what you're asking it to learn. And all of that work is making sure your data is correct, making sure your data is not like biased in some way that's causing the, uh, you know, the framework to learn something that you don't want it to learn or to learn something wrong. Uh, so yeah, it's all, it's all data. I would say 90% of the time, if not more. What is this raw data that you're working with kind of look like? Yeah, uh, well, so for, for neural networks, for example, um, you basically, uh, you feed it um, basically an RGB array. Um, and it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. Um, the, these frameworks uh, and algorithms have gotten so good that it almost doesn't matter how you give it the data. Uh, you can give it 
an RGB file, you can give it a JPEG, you can give it a compressed file, probably not compressed, but it will, it will figure out like what it is you meant based on how you set up. This is the input. This is what I expect. It will figure out like the in between. If it needs to like decode your image or like turn it into a byte array, it will do it for you. Like some of these things are just incredible right now. Yeah. I guess and once you have it's kind of a lot of things, but that iteration, right? Once you have kind of this cool software that can decode these images, you've had that for a year, you've still got this development team of 50 people who are like, well, how about we figure out if somebody gives us a broken file or a JPEG or a GIF or a compressed file, like you said, like, let's make it work in all these cases. Right. Oh, we got another question that we'll get to in, in a minute. Um, <laughs> yeah, everybody wants to know about that. Um, so I'll jump to it. Um, Martin says, hey, Yuri, how's the surf in California? And Blaine um, follows up. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome, man. Uh, just today I was surfing uh, like six or seven foot waves. In oh, wow. Nice. So, yeah, it was excellent. Cool. <laughs> Thick wetsuit, though, I, I imagine. Uh, yeah, I have a, like, four-millimeter wetsuit. Uh, but, like, it's it's pretty warm. It's pretty warm. Nice. Cool. Yeah. So thank you for that quick side note. Um, <laughs> well, to just kind of sum up what it is that we've talked about, right? We've talked about kind of what is Python, where does it lie in kind of all the other major frameworks, kind of what is machine learning and data science, how can we kind of um, – how is somebody – wants to go down that path, how they can do it. So just to kind of sum up before we kind of jump into the next kind of section here, could you kind of summarize um, th that same path again? Like you're talking to a friend, let's say they know Python now, they've learned Python and they're, they're saying, okay, what should I do next? I really want to learn, how, I really want to be, be able to write that algorithm that can detect cats and dogs. Or, you know, one for me personally, I'm a big um, fan of cetaceans and marine wildlife and there, I know for a fact, you know, the way that you identify whales oftentimes is pictures of their flukes, their tails, right? Mm. And basically, the, right now, it's just people with binoculars and cameras, oftentimes like high school kids that are out on the sea or out on the beaches, and they're basically doing everything they can to track these migrations of whales. But there's no interstate communication, right? So the kids in Alaska and Washington, Oregon, California, Mexico, Hawaii, they've all got these big books of pictures of flukes, and they manually go through the pages trying to match pictures so that they can understand population sizes and migration patterns and stuff. And I've always thought, man, that would be so cool to build a, like a website that anyone could upload pictures to, right? Not only could we, um, I mean, at the, at the very minimum, try to match pictures so that we, you know, a picture that was uploaded in Hawaii and a picture that was uploaded in, in Alaska, three months apart of the same fluke. Now, we just, now we've just put together this whale's you know, migration pattern. So, you know, that would be like a, a dream project I would love to work on. But, yeah. For a friend who's just getting started, they know Python now, um, and I know you've already said this, so it's a little bit redundant, but what's the three-step process that they should do so that they can write that cat versus dog um, algorithm? Yeah, uh, so Python, um, I would say get familiar with some of the basic technologies, NumPy, SciPy, TensorFlow, and when I say get familiar, I mean like spend like two, three weeks doing some of the tutorials online and just get a feel for it. Um, and then I would finish that with taking a kind of a structured data, data science course. Uh, and I would start with something free on Coursera, for example. Right. Nice. Yeah. Great. So uh, to digress, the first step in all of this, as you mentioned, and as we mentioned a few times, is learning Python, right? So this brings us to, um, to Coding Nomads. At, at Coding Nomads, we teach Python software development. We have both in-person intensive courses. We've got a course coming up uh, this fall that Yuri will be teaching. It's actually based in Bali, which will be wonderful. Um, and we also have online coding courses that are basically more for the people who are interested in, they definitely want to know more. They've, they've gotten past maybe the, the free tutorials. They're looking for a comprehensive course with mentorship, people that they can talk to, reach out to on Slack, have meetings with, screen shares, code reviews, et cetera. It's, a, it's, it's kind of a serious kind of dip your toe in the water kind of course before maybe enrolling in an intensive 16-week in-person kind of course. So at Coding Nomads, we offer both of those kind of the light uh, online. Usually it takes people about two months to finish the course. Um, and then we have a 16-week intensive uh, where we have oftentimes four to eight weeks in person. The, the, our course coming up in Bali that Yuri, Yuri will be teaching is four weeks in Bali. That starts on October 12th. I believe. 
And that course, um, it has a two months of, of online prep, basically. So the idea is an, that you get to the first day of the in-person course already being pretty comfortable in Python, right? Because one of the kind of biggest challenges that we've faced and kind of one of the things that we've noticed the most in our most successful graduates is people who did a, a lot of very serious prep before coming, you know, before day one of the in-person course. So now that's built into our courses. We've spent the past six months or so building out this online learning platform and putting all of our curriculum on there. It's really wonderful and we're, all, we're very, very proud of it. It's comprehensive. It's all custom videos and tutorials and quizzes and labs. Um, and then that's the prep. So two months of that getting ready for our in-person course in Bali. Um, and then Yuri, if you could just tell us a little bit about, maybe give us a quick breakdown, maybe a week by week breakdown of um, what you guys are going to be learning in Bali in October. Yeah, um, so the plan is as follows. Uh, the first week will be uh, basically kind of advanced programming topics. So um, we'll basically build on whatever you've built, you've worked on in the first month online. Uh, so we'll skip all the basic programming stuff and go straight to like best practices, algorithms, patterns, um, basically more advanced topics. Um, then the next two weeks, we'll be working on web development. Uh, so we'll be developing a web uh, server-based app and I'll be teaching you all about developing web servers, best practices, developing an API. Uh, so you'll, you'll learn basically all of that. And then the last week will be uh, a data science portion. Uh, so we'll be diving in basically into kind of the introduction to data science, do, do data visualization, uh, do some uh, learning, basic learning techniques. Uh, we can maybe talk about neural networks. I don't think we'll get to it, but uh, we'll do some basic statistics. Uh, so basically kind of a bootstrap you for continuing to learning data science. Um, and then uh, there will be a capstone project uh, after that, uh, which hopefully you can incorporate both the web development and the data science component uh, into a project. Right. And these final projects, just to chime in there, um, it's the same model that we've been following in Coding Nomads for the last three years, which is basically after the last month of our intensive courses, we team people up, oftentimes two or three people uh, together, to work on a larger project um, over the course of a month or more. Um, typically, as we're moving through the course, you know, for the first three months of our intensive course, it's new topics on a near daily basis, right? So topics, labs, mini projects, topics, labs, mini projects, kind of learning, learning, learning. And the final month during the capstone month is the base of the opportunity to kind of synthesize all that knowledge into a much larger project that you can work on as a team, so you can get really used to the Kind of the workflow as a software engineer working on a code base concurrently with other people which is can be quite difficult at times um and you get to spend a month you know kind of putting all of these concepts together and oftentimes our students will go well beyond a month and they'll continue working together um, build out portfolio projects and or kind of um prototypes of kind of applications they wish that they existed or for me for instance um, I'll be acting as um, Yuri's assistant in this course. I'll, you know, for my final project, I'm going to be trying to build that whale tail recognition system. <laughs> um, okay. And great. So one of the things that we want to throw out there as, as a gift for people who watch this webinar is basically a, a promo code. So for anybody who applies in the next two weeks or before the, the, um, the deadline of July 31st, we basically, if you mentioned that you watched this, webinar and you mentioned that the, go, the promo code is go big then we'll be able to give you either hundred dollars off of our online course or two hundred fifty dollars off of our in-person course so just throwing that out there but if you so if you see this and you'd like to join us either online or at our upcoming course in Bali just mention it to us mention you saw this webinar and uh, mention the words go big which is what we like to do and and we'll see if we can help you out so yeah thank you Yuri, for your time. Thank you, everybody else, for joining. I hope that this was useful. Um, I see Chris. Uh, Chris just asked a question. So, um, Chris asked, "What do you think the difference would be from someone who went to your Bali Python course versus someone who did what you talked about earlier, take a couple of free courses on Coursera? Are there some things you think a person would likely not learn if they try to do this on their own, or something it would likely take a very long time on your own to get?" So that's a great question, Chris. I think we could probably both speak to that. Um, the, the primary difference, I think, for me, and the way I would answer that, is the type of learner, right? So uh, some people are very, very good at self-motivating and really driving themselves through these kind of intense um, courses without any support, right? 
And other people, and I would probably be one of these people, just work a lot better when they have someone to bounce ideas off of, someone to kind of show them the ropes, kind of make the path more clear, explain to them these concepts in more layman's terms, give them code reviews, kind of help, help them. Sometimes you can get stuck at a bug where you can work on this thing for four or five hours, making zero progress, lose all your momentum and all your motivation. And when, we, when you have mentorship, like let's say you could hop on a call with Yuri or me or any of our other mentors and instructors, and they're like, oh, you just gotta do X, Y, Z. And then you know, 30 seconds later, you're past that bug, you understand what it was, but you're moving forward. And so it's kind of the difference in, in, in learning styles. If you're somebody who is totally a good self-starter, self-motivator, you can push yourself through these difficult things and spend five hours getting through those bugs and just do that. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what we do as software engineers. So getting good and used to that early is good. Um, but if, you, you know, if you're wanting to make a lot of progress really fast, and have somebody there or have a team of people there to basically support you and answer these questions really quickly um, to kind of keep you moving forward, also to keep you accountable. Um, that's basically one of, the, one of the largest roles that we play as well. We deliver information, but then we also help synthesize that information and then keep people accountable to keep pushing on that. Um, you're, that was a long answer, but Yuri, would you have anything to add there? Uh, yeah, uh, in addition um, to all of that, I would also say that like some of my some of my favorite times in my career have been like when I'm in the same room with a bunch of coworkers and we're on a whiteboard solving some difficult problem and we're all brainstorming and we're bringing up ideas and we're saying, Oh no, that won't work. Why don't we try it this way? And right. it's like being in the same place, working on the same problem. There's something incredibly um, motivating and also like you, you learn more, you learn from each other. Uh, something you just, you, you don't get that same feeling from a textbook, right? Which is kind of what these online courses sometimes are. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you totally can learn that way. Uh, and many people have, but I, you know, I think you'll learn more and you'll accelerate quite a bit. Yeah, I agree. And Martin chimed in to uh, saying something, a great point, which is basically Mar Martin said, I'll chime in from my own experience. I've spent a lot of time with the free online resources and they're great and they're quality material and there's all kinds of quality material out there. However, the real difference is community um, and the interpersonal connections that you get when joining a course or a cohort or, or a boot camp. Um, being in a spot together with a bunch of dedicated people for a focused period of time makes a huge difference. Because, and this is one of the reasons why um, you know going to a place like Bali or Thailand or Mexico or Barcelona, there are various places where we, we run courses, and we love the Bali course. Um, you're 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 just there for a month at a time uh, with a group of people that are all there for the same reason. You're, you're removed from your day-to-day -day distractions, all the birthdays, the friends and family, and all the all the things that would generally keep you to only studying for maybe a half an hour or an hour a day at best sometimes. When you join a course like ours and you join us in Bali, it's all day, every day, and you're with this group of people that's also really excited, really motivated, really hardworking. And it's really neat because oftentimes by the end of the course, people will basically just be spending like the you know our day will end around six o'clock or something like that and people might leave go for a swim go grab some food and then everybody will come back to the co-working space turn on some music um maybe they'll order food in because you can get all the delicious food delivered right to where we work and basically spend all night just hanging out working chatting you know messing around but then getting back to seriousness and the amount of productivity that the amount of kind of progress you can make in that you know zone in that experience just dwarfs kind of you know sitting at home kind of um, reading a tutorial online, right? So, but it's all, I would say, start wherever you can, right? And I say this to everybody, every, all of these, uh, you know, the longest journey starts with a single step, right? So we want, if you're thinking about getting into it, start where you can. If right now you're, you've got a full-time job and you're not able to leave and um, you're not necessarily ready to, to invest a couple hundred dollars or a couple thousand dollars into a course, start with the free stuff. Take that as far as you can, right? It's, there's a mountain of really, really valuable information out there. And then when you're ready, when you think, okay, I'm, I'm kind of getting stuck, I'm not sure where to go from here, then that's kind of the point where you start looking into maybe these mentored courses, for instance, like Coding Nomads. Um, so I know we've gone over the, we're, we're, we're past the one hour mark and I don't want to hold anybody too much longer. Um, so again, thank you to everybody who joined. Um, thank you, Yuri, for your time and for sharing all of your knowledge with us. Um, what, got one more. Cool, great, glad you found it useful, Tom. Um, thank you everybody for joining. I, um, the last thing I would show you guys is for, if you're curious to learn more, if you're curious about um, Coding Nomads, what we do, where we do it, how we do it, uh, visit 
codingnomads.co um, online. And you can request all of our syllabus. You can learn about our upcoming courses. You can read everything that we do. Um, and if you apply, as I mentioned, for any of our courses in the next two weeks, and you mentioned that you watch this webinar and, and say the two words go big, then we'll be able to give you a bit of a discount on those courses. So have a great uh, day, evening, morning, everybody. And thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Yuri. Thank you.